Bill kind of snuck up on me and finished quicker than I thought he was going to. I was just so focused on singing some songs that I love that I got distracted by the fact that I had to come up here. I wonder if we think about the good news that Jesus came to preach. I mean, I grew up hearing about the good news, right? Did you? Hey, you guys are talking back to me now. That's amazing. Keep it up. I grew up hearing all about um, his life, his death, his resurrection, this good news that God, through Jesus, is restoring creation, reclaiming creation, bringing an end to sin and death, that he is um, dealing with the sin that separates us from God. But I wonder if I think about the good news as revealed in what Jesus was doing when he was here, walking the ancient roads and encountering people, human beings, trapped in sin and suffering because of our slavery to sin and death. The bondage that we experience because of the powers, the forces that are opposed to the rule, the kingdom of God. Sometimes I just wonder if I really think about it. Humans choose sin. I'm not sure that I understand exactly how, but I know that we do. We choose sin. And Paul talks about it in ways that um, help me understand myself a little better. There's a passage from Romans 7. For I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Paul writes in this section in Romans that we were invited to read this week about the law and how the law allows or perhaps um, helps is a better way to say it. Helps us identify That sin, the sin nature that is at work within us. We are taught through the law to understand good and evil. To recognize it in ourselves. But Paul is trying to help us understand that when we recognize sin, when we know that what we have done is wrong, we are now trapped. Trapped by sin. And we stand powerless. We are slaves to sin. It is our master. I love how human beings long to think of ourselves as our own master. I just um, love how messed up we are. Perhaps that is the great lie humanity believes that leads us to sin. Is that we are our own master. We have rejected our creator, our true master, and we claim mastery over ourselves. And we believe the lie. We deceive ourselves. And sin, sin takes hold, and now we're trapped, unable to free ourselves. And in this understanding, I think if we can pause long enough to hear what Paul is trying to help us understand... The arrival of Jesus uh, makes a lot more sense to me, at least in the perspective of good news. Here's Mark 1. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. 
the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. The news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. That last bit always gets me. The demons are under the command of Jesus, prevented from speaking because they know who he is. It seems that the demons are powerless in the presence of the Son of God. Oh, they might have power over human beings. Don't miss that in the story. They have power over human beings, but they do not have power over God. Jesus gives commands, and they are bound to obey. And that held my attention as I was reading this week. Seeing these miracles of Jesus healing the sick, freeing them from demons that possess them. And I kept wondering, do I understand the good news? I comfort myself really quickly. Don't worry. I don't let myself get too lost. I mean, I know that I get it, right? I mean, come on. Right? I'm not so sure that I have let the power of the good news, the gospel, sink in all the way. I mean, is it possible that I'm just hearing the message written by the writer of Hebrews for the first time? Hebrews 6, therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. I think maybe a lot has been said about the elementary teachings about Jesus. I'm, I'm going to guess gobs of stuff has been said about the elementary teaching of Jesus. His death for sin. His resurrection to bring eternal life. I'll bet you if I bring some kids up here real quick, they can tell us all about how Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. And how he rose from the dead so that we can live with God forever when we die. The elementary teaching about Jesus. But something tells me the words of the rest of the chapter are supposed to help me understand, as Peter says so well, those hard things the Apostle Paul writes. So I picked one. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it. And that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. I didn't clear anything up at all. (laughs) But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Now hold on. Romans 7. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who raised, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. 
For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what was once bound, what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. These passages are trying to help us understand that the good news of Jesus is bringing an end to the mastery of sin in our lives. And that if we understand the power of Jesus to free us from the bondage of sin, then we should not continue to bear the fruit of death. More sin. But that we should bear the fruit of life. Specifically, the life of Jesus that through the Spirit of God that He has placed within us produces life. Now, I know that's hard for us to think about because uh, somehow, somewhere along the way, um, the words in the message always get twisted and this um, voice begins to whisper to us, See, because you sin, you don't really belong to Jesus. Or sometimes that same voice whispers lies to you saying, See, you are so much better than they are. You don't sin like they do. They're such a mess. Such losers. But you have got this thing figured out. Because sin puffs up. Sin tears down. And it keeps you tossed back and forth. A prisoner. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is writing these words that all of us could speak. I am the wretched man rescued from the body of death. We are the demon possessed. And we need the presence of the teacher, the word of God in the flesh to set us free. We need the grace of God to heal us from our diseases. So I want you to listen to Luke's version of the same story. Then he went down to to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak. Because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. 
The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record the miracles of Jesus, not just to reveal the power of God present in Jesus to help us see that he was the Messiah. They record these moments to reveal that Jesus has the power to release us from the body of death that lives, that reigns in us. We are meant to understand that the presence of Jesus in us through the spirit of God that he has placed within us is able to defeat what holds us captive. What plagues our hearts. That Jesus has the power to touch you. To touch your heart and to set you free. I think we often struggle because we fail to take hold of this good news. To believe, to believe it with all of our heart. Maybe that voice is telling you to diminish. Maybe that voice is telling you that I'm diminishing your faith. I'm telling you you're somehow weak. That your faith is just not strong enough. But tell that voice to be quiet in the name of Jesus. It has to listen to his name. Let Jesus speak the truth to your heart. It is a simple truth. It's presented by all the gospel writers. Jesus is the master. Jesus has power. Jesus speaks. And the wind and the waves, and the demons, the fevers, must all obey. Sickness, even death, has no power in the presence of Jesus. And while I am prone to believe I am somehow a failure, or trapped, stuck, because sin is still present in me. Well, I guess I am stuck. But scripture has more to say to my heart. To express for me the hurt that my heart is feeling. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. These words are pretty familiar to my heart. They sound very similar to the ones that run through my head. The ones that plague my heart and my mind and burden my soul. But they're not true. Because <laughs> I stop too soon. I don't listen all the way through. I'm so prone to just sit in my misery, my frustration, my anger. My failure. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. For he has been good to me. Jesus is the revelation of the faithfulness of God. <laughs> the gospel writers are pointing to all these things that Jesus is doing. He didn't just show up and go to the cross. He showed up. 
and sat quiet with people while they cried. He went to funerals. He visited the sick. It is Jesus who is the testimony, the evidence of God's unfailing love. Because he joined us in our hurt. God has, through Jesus, offered us the rescue that our soul is afraid to hope for. But that faith makes possible. I want you to look at Isaiah 53. This famous passage that we know so well. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, if you did your reading this week, this passage is referred to in Matthew. Now, the interesting thing about it is it's not at the cross. Matthew tells us that Jesus fulfills this passage. He fulfills this promise of God carrying our iniquities when he is freeing people from demons and disease. I I need church for us to pause and recognize that for a second. Because we read that text and we go to the cross. But Matthew wants you to read that text and go to Jesus touching the sick. And casting out demons. So that you will see that Jesus has shown up to bore our iniquities. In the everyday things that hurt. And bring sorrow. And make us feel trapped. Think about that. The power of Jesus to release people from demons and disease. Is him bearing our iniquity and sin. When he touches the sick. When he heals the blind. When he releases the demon possessed. He is the evidence Of God's enduring faithfulness. And so if you believe the elementary truths about Jesus. His crucifixion. And his resurrection. Then the challenge today is to believe the whole good news. Not just one little beginning point. As the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to see. Not just that. Believe the whole story. The good news is that Jesus can cure you. You can cry out to Jesus and ask him to be your master. In the power of Jesus, you can be set free and no longer be a slave to sin. We who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You see, the truth is that the great high priest is here. And he is ready to extend the healing power of God to you. Not just the forgiveness of God, but the healing power of God. He has come to free you from the burden of sin, the death that reigns in you. To extend healing, to give life, eternal life to you. Perhaps this is too hard because maybe we start hearing those voices whispering lies again. Because there is still sickness and illness in our world. 
Maybe it's just too easy to believe the voice that says, it's not for you. But there is something deep and profound about accepting this truth. Just as Jesus encouraged us to believe. We are invited to have the faith of a child to accept this simple truth. The presence of God is revealed in Jesus. Those opposed to him know his identity. They are powerless in his presence. Where Jesus is, sin cannot reign. It can't. It's not in charge. God reigns where Jesus is present. The kingdom is near to you when you believe with childlike faith that being in the presence of Jesus is enough. You have the ability to call on the name of Jesus for the power that you need in your life. You can call out because he's already here. Faith has ushered you behind the curtain. You're in the presence of the great high priest. Isn't that why we take communion? Because we're in the presence of the Lord? It's his table? It's his body and his blood that we're remembering? And we're present with him? And we take it in? I I realize it's wonderfully symbolic. But isn't that what we're doing? Is saying... God's not out there. I take him in here. And where Jesus is, sin cannot reign. And we have to believe it. Because if we listen to the lies, we'll give up. But if we listen to the voice of truth, Can you hear him speaking? You're mine. You belong to me. I died for you. I rose for you. I've placed my spirit within you. I have gone to prepare you a place, but I'm coming back. I'm still here. My spirit dwells in you. It's my spirit that empowers you. Not your flesh. Can you believe that today? Can you take the bread and the cup and believe that today? When we take communion every week, the elders go to the back of the room. And those of you who are lucky enough to be in the room should take advantage of that. You have an opportunity that people on the other side of that camera don't have. Don't, don't waste it. If you need to go back there, you can just whisper to them and say, those voices that Troy's talking about, they're loud. Pray with me. Pray for someone that you love. And I wish that there was some way that I could jump through the screen. But you're just going to have to take advantage of a thing called email. And and find the church online. And send Bill an email. And he'll make sure the elders get it. And they'll pray for you. And do not let today go by. If you believe the elementary truth about Jesus, then you know that baptism is our participation. It's our claiming that we are no longer masters of ourselves, that we have died to self 
We have been buried with Christ. That we've been raised, forgiven of sin, but empowered by the Spirit. That we're going to live forever with God. Those things are all true. But if you haven't claimed it in baptism yet, then don't let today go by. Find someone who will speak the truth to you. They've been working on this baptistry. Bob, is it ready? Well, amazing. Isn't that good news? That means that there's no excuse. No delay. If you need to be buried with Christ. To become new. Then listen to his voice and respond in faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the bread that reminds us of the body of Christ. That he present in our world is the fulfillment of your faithfulness. And that his body bore our sin, our iniquity. And we pray, Father, as we take it, that we would understand this truth. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you for the all-sufficient power of the blood of Christ. To atone for our sin. And we pray, Father, as we take this cup, that we would remember that we would believe it. And that we would know that you have anointed us. That you have claimed us as your children. And so the same power that you gave in the resurrection of Jesus is present in us to defeat sin. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.